Hello, I'm Jean-Nicolas Meo from uh, Meo Camusé in Burgundy. And I'm Jay Boberg with Nicolas Jay in Oregon. Great. So it's great to say hello to you and tell us a uh, little bit of our, about ourselves. I've, uh, I've been making wine at Meo Camusé since 1989. I took over the family estate at that time, um, actually the first in the family in, uh, in, in a number of years to do that. So that was a, that was a big, uh, big task uh, that, that was um, asked of me. And um, I was very fortunate to um, learn uh, this uh, job under uh, Henri Jaillet, who, was, uh, who had a strong connection with our family and was uh, hired as a consultant uh, in uh, in uh, 89 uh, to teach me how to make wine just after his uh, retirement and it was a really interesting and thrilling time to start over in, uh, in 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 burgundy since it was really a turning point a moment when the really the the region was uh, was picking up and and taking a, a real quality turn and you and I met in 1987, 88. Uh, I was yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere before, before somewhere I was just a wine drinker then. Yes, yes, I exactly. Know. And I was in the music business. I started out as a musician and uh, had the good fortune of um, starting a record company called IRS Records while I was in college and uh, spent most of my career in the music industry, but drinking plenty of wine all the way along. And uh, I met jean Nicola there at uh, Penn uh, when I was in Philadelphia visiting my sister, and uh, we struck up a friendship, which has now gone for, believe it or not, more than 30 years, the risk of showing our age. And uh, this is how we met. So this was not a shotgun marriage. This, we've had many decades of drinking wine together, and uh, it ended up with uh, me approaching Jean Nicola about this idea of making wine in Oregon, a region that we both felt had enormous possibilities. But uh, Jean Nicola's response, as any dear friend would be when you approach an illustrious winemaker as himself, was maybe. Maybe, because he said, we need to make world-class wine. I can't do anything less. We need to do our due diligence and spend time in Oregon and make sure we can access the, the greatest fruit and have the best sites and that we can in fact make world-class wine. Yes, that was, uh, that was really the, uh, the, the interesting uh, challenge about it. And uh, as uh, we progressed with our, uh, with our project, we discovered that really uh, Oregon had a lot of potential. We, um, went into the region and tasted many, many wines, uh, visited many cellars. We were very welcomed by uh, the folks in the, in the region. So that was uh, very, very encouraging. And I realized that um, Oregon had many things to, uh, to share with Burgundy in terms of uh, the spirit, the hands-on approach, the, uh, uh, also the collaboration, uh, probably more than in Burgundy, uh, and the dedication to Pinot Noir. This, uh, this, the, the, the region is really serious and with, uh, with Pinot Noir. So this is, uh, I think this is the, uh, I felt that was the uh, becoming uh, the other mecca of uh, Pinot Noir, and that was really worth uh, investing some time and some work in, the, in, in our region. And so in 2014, we made our first vintage, and that was the beginning of Nicolas J. So the, the vineyards in, in, in Oregon and the, the, the farming was a great um, and a very good surprise, and uh, uh, actually and, uh, a great point of our um, beginning of the beginning of the adventure. We uh, arrived in, a, in, in, in Oregon, of course, I knew about the diversity of the region, but I saw so many ABAs, so many very uh, diverse terroirs and uh, very, very specific with, how, with, with having a very uh, strong personality. And I didn't know it was going to show uh, to that extent uh, early on actually, and that you would have as much differences between Dundee Hills and McMinnville as 
you know, between Vaudreau Manet and, and, and Louis Saint-Georges, for example. Right. So that was, that, was a great, uh, that was a great discovery and uh, nurturing these, uh, these special places, uh, bringing up the personality of the wines and working around uh, uh, expressing the, the really the great personality and the great character of these wines was, was really the, the, the job we did on uh, the, the first uh, vintages and we carry on, of course, doing. But that was really the, the, the most exciting thing we did in, uh, in the first years. And we have such great farming partners. Uh, we, we farm eight different vineyards, one of which we own, the Bishop Creek Vineyard, planted in the late 80s, uh, which is organically farmed. And then all the other vineyards are either organically farmed, biodynamically farmed, and we have one vineyard which is farmed according to the live standard, which is sustainable farming practices that was created there in Oregon. And as I mentioned, our farming partners are fantastic. I mean, they're great farmers and they're great partners and they are really essential in our achieving the highest caliber of grapes and the highest quality of wine. I mean, as you've said many times, the, you, you can't make great wine if you don't have great grapes coming out of the vineyards. Um, and, and that's also what led to our whole vine to vat initiative, where we've worked with each of, of our farming partners and at Bishop Creek to make sure that those grapes come off the vine and make it into the vat in the same condition that they are before we pick them. And when we're out, when I'm out doing the sampling, you have these pristine grapes and you taste them and you say, okay, we're ready to go. jean Nicola will decide, Tracy will all decide, okay, we're ready to pick. And it's how do we get those into the vat without getting damaged? And so that has to do with, uh, uh, you know, how we pick them, how we, we use these cherry bins to make sure they don't get crushed. We try to transport them. We always pick first in the morning so that they stay very cold so that after they come out of the vats, uh, out of the, the, the cherry bins onto the sorting line and into the vat, they are still very cold. Um, we take all these steps just to make sure that much like you would with a cherry or a tomato or anything else, we're basically trying to preserve the, the, the freshness and the, uh, the, the pristine nature or of with, those grapes. Or with grapes from Burgundy. Because uh, from Burgundy, yes, indeed, you treat them like gold as you should. Yes, no, this is this is a point I really um, like to stress and emphasize, and I really uh, this is something I really insisted on when I came over to. Uh, uh, it's not, and this is something personal because it's not necessarily shared very widely in, in, in Burgundy, but this is the respect of the fruit from the vineyard to the cuvee is really very important to me. In terms of winemaking, uh, basically it's the same frame as uh, in Burgundy. I uh, went to um, Oregon thinking, why, you know, it should, should work. There is uh, no reason why it, uh, uh, the same principles should not work. Um, so we, um, we, we do the same, um, that is, there is a cold soak after a few days uh, with some pump overs to really uh, homogenize uh, the vat. Then um, natural yeast, fermentation starts, uh, we monitor the temperature and we do some punch downs, gentle punch downs in the end. Of course, it's entirely destemmed. Um, and this is, um, really uh, something that is working in both regions and um, generally people are saying that they can really relate uh, the wines uh, with, uh, with another. Uh, there is a, a clear uh, proximity in, in the wines. Of course, the, uh, the aim is also to uh, bring in the character of both regions and of course uh, Oregon taste uh, uh, hopefully has uh, as argon as it should taste, but um, um, teaching and uh, and and telling the uh, uh, the uh, the general uh, principles and techniques of vinification um, was 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 quite simple. What happens after uh, the winemaking um, per se is um, also um, very much inspired by. Uh, we do in Burgundy. We have a number of um, uh, 
uh, new barrels that uh, we order from uh, Francois Frère in uh, Saint Romain that are done exactly the same way with the same recipe that we use at uh, Meuka Musée. And uh, not with the same proportion. Um, we have about, we make about 30% uh, uh, new oak with these, uh, with our Oregon wines, 50% sometimes uh, with the, uh, with the single vineyards. Uh, it is important as uh, in Burgundy to leave time uh, and not to rush this élevage. Uh, wines uh, have a, an aging pattern which is slightly different in, in, in Oregon. They tend to age a little or quicker at first, but then they do need the time to settle down and come together. And this is really the, the, this concept of letting the time is, is the same in two regions, even, even if the pattern is a little bit different, but it's no different than, uh, you know, making a Richebourg or a Provougeau. It has, uh, you have to um, monitor the wines and, and, and try not to, um, to uh, focus or do too many things to the wine and monitor the wines so that they come at their best. And when it comes to bottling, unfined, unfiltered, uh, because it works. And this is, uh, this is where the wines are at the best. And uh, this is uh, why the, the, the wines show, uh, show, show, show well ultimately in, uh, in the bottle and in the glass. The 2017 vintage was actually the first vintage since the beginning of Nicolas J that you would actually consider to be normal or close to normal for Oregon. It was the first cooler vintage and it really wasn't cool, it was just average. We had um, a, a, a good long growing season. We had uh, some, some bits of spikes of heat in early September. We had a, a 10 day stretch where the temperatures got into the 90s, which was fantastic for the grapes. But what really made the difference was we had some rain, not a ton of rain, but we had some rain there later in September, uh, a week, 10 days before we harvested, which really gave the grapes some, um, some nice freshness and, and allowed the grapes and the vines to really uh, uh, ripen and get ready. And so we did the first pick, I believe, on the 27th of September, which was uh, a little bit of a longer growing season in, 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 than we'd had in the previous years. So the wines um, do um, show very pleasant and uh, quite uh, balanced uh, uh, character. First of all, we had uh, um, a very nice uh, ripening season, as Jay explained, and the wines are uh, around 13.5% uh, um, alcohol. So they do have a, a, a mellowness and um, you know, a, a sweetness and, and a approachability to, to, to them, which is extremely pleasant. Um, and uh, I think that these, this vintage is really pretty pretty. It's, um, it's, it's evolved progressively, not, not rapidly in, in bats, progressively. We took our time, we bottled this uh, uh, early, uh, early 19. And uh, they, they show a really beautiful bouquet, beautiful and fine and refined bouquet, and are extremely soft, uh, have a wonderful texture and extremely soft and fresh at the same time. And I think this is um, arguably our most pretty vintage. Uh, uh, and the most approachable out of the gate. I mean, I think coming out of the bottle, these wines taste yeah. fantastic now. And uh, certainly with some of the earlier vintages, certainly 15 in particular, needed that time in the bottle. It needed a year or two and you needed to decant that wine and, and so forth at the beginning. Of course, now it's showing great, but the 17 really is, is, is approachable and, and fantastic to drink. Yes, previous vintages were impressive. You, you felt the structure, you were impressed, but with, with 17, you should really drink them with a lot of pleasure. Although I do believe this will, uh, will, will age well. I mean, I don't think this is a, a vintage that will not uh, uh, last. Uh, it certainly has the, the depth and the structure to be able to, to it really kind of has it all. Very, very understandable vintage.
our first harvest of Chardonnay out of the Bishop Creek Vineyard gave us a pretty remarkably perfect season. Uh, 2018 did not have the heat spikes and, and, and the sort of variability that we had seen in many of our previous vintages. It was actually very gentle, very gradual, and very long. Uh, we ended up picking uh, on September 14th, and the grapes were basically perfect. And this was our first vintage since grafting over those vines in Bishop Creek in 2015. And the wine that it has created is a wine that is um, really balanced, has a lovely acidity and minerality, uh, which John Nickel and I both cherish in, in the white wines that we drink from anywhere. Uh, but it also has that concentration of fruit to sort of provide that balance and provide that tension in the wine. The wine is really satisfying. Uh, that's the thing that I would say about it. It's, it's a wine that is approachable and a wine that, that you put it in your mouth and it really has this sort of fills up the mouth. It has weight, um, but it's in no main, means oaky. It's uh, a wine that saw no new oak, uh, but was fermented in natural barrels, natural oak barrels, but used natural oak barrels. So barrels that don't influence the wine. I mean, it's really quite lovely. Yes, I think we, we, we want actually to uh, avoid two, uh, two pitfalls here. Uh, the uh, over lean and mineral and upright and tight Chardonnays that, um, uh, that are made in some regions and some at some domains of, uh, of Burgundy. Not talking about Chablis here, but rather the, of, of the Côte d'Or. And at the same time, not imitating the over-riched and over-oaked uh, Chardonnay that are right. made in some places in, uh, in, uh, in America or Australia. This is, we, we, we really like the, the richness, but not over, uh, overdoing it and uh, the tightness, no, not so much. So I was really pleased with that first wine and this progressive season, the fact that I was pointing out day after day, we'd watch, watch the Chardonnay, watch the Chardonnay, watch the Chardonnay, and actually it was so progressive and, and, and ripening in, in, in really uh, very, uh, in stages and, and nicely and gently that uh, I didn't have to uh, worry too much uh, about the wine thereafter. Nature worked with us very well in our first vintage of Chardonnay. She was very, very helpful here. And we made about 120 cases. So there's not a lot of it, but uh, what we have is good. Two thousand seventeen was a particularly great vintage for Bishop Creek. The reason why is because Bishop Creek, as many of you know, is quite a structured wine and a wine that can be quite big and quite sturdy and have a lot of backbone. And so, consequently, with two seven two thousand seventeen being a more gentle vintage, a longer vintage, a vintage that has created very approachable wines, you have really a magical vintage for Bishop Creek. Yes, it's a, it's a great compliment. And I think that uh, the wine will be a little bit more approachable than usual early on without compromising the uh, ageability of, uh, of uh, that particular wine. So um, I'm very excited about uh, the 17 uh, Bishop Creek, which is actually, this is a very exciting wine every, every year. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it, uh, you, you have to uh, really tame the wine because of uh, the, the, the structure. We have an old vineyard at Bishop Creek uh, uh, planted in um, uh, 87, 88. So we do have a kind of natural concentration and refinement, a good variety of clones that we're uh, playing with. Um, but generally the, the core of the wine is made of uh, the pomade of uh, the um, older uh, blocks. We have a hint of Badensville. Badensville is a clone that um, brings a lot of uh, tannins and uh, must be used with, uh, with the, the, the really uh, in, in small quantities, but it's uh, in, in 17, it was very useful. And we have two Dijon clones, what are called Dijon clones. Uh, so uh, uh, later clones, let's say, um, uh, Triple Seven, which is a clone which is naturally rich and sweet, 
So a little bit of that uh, also, not too much, but brings a little bit of, um, of, of uh, uh, richness to the wine. And 667, which is a clone I really love because it's, it's very refined. It's both uh, uh, big and concentrated with the very fine and very refined uh, finish. So this is a wine with uh, um, naturally also unfine and filtered, and this is a wine that uh, should really show well in the in the months and years to come. And of course, it is organically farmed, as as all of our vineyards are, uh, and it's 250 cases in 2017. So very small production, but uh, Bishop Creek being our estate vineyard and our our, our happy home. We're very pleased with the 2017 Bishop Creek Pinot Noir. In 2017, for the first time, we made an own rooted blend of Pinot Noir. The eight vineyards that go into our Willamette Valley since 2014, three of them are on their own roots, meaning ungrafted vines. They're not on rootstock. And in 2017, we said, hey, what about the idea of doing a blend that is exclusively the three vineyards that are on their own roots? And so we did. And uh, we made about 156 cases of which we call own rooted. Yeah, that was, that was an experiment that was really uh, intriguing because, uh, of course, you know that in Europe we cannot work with that kind of wine. Everything is, uh, is grafted. So that was uh, um, an experiment uh, that uh, we wanted to, to, to make somehow. And this wine is uh, very fine. Has it worked. It, the experiment really worked. It really worked because the, the, the wine is really, is really special. It has a, a, an extra layer of complexity, minerality, finesse, uh, which is absolutely intriguing and, and fascinating and, and uh, lovely. Uh, and um, naturally, we're, uh, we're left to believe uh, and to uh, wonder whether this is... Uh, due to uh, the greatness of these uh, vineyards, because Highland is a very old vineyard in, in Oregon, planted in the 70s, and Nisa is a vineyard which is planted at the uh, very beginning of the 90s, yeah, 1990. and uh, Bishop Creek at the uh, end of the 80s. So these vineyards really bring a, 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 a natural complexity uh, to the wine. So is it the vineyards and the green vineyards, the fact that this blend works with these three, uh, three vineyards, or is it because of uh, the uh, ungrafted uh, character of these vineyards that this wine is so intriguing? We'll let you uh, decide by yourself. So 2017 was a terrific vintage. It was the first cooler climate vintage that we had since we launched Nicolas in 2014. It was, thank God, not super hot and super warm and all the challenges that that brought. It was actually a nice uh, uh, average cooler climate summer. And we had a nice heat sp spike in September that really helped ripen the grapes, followed by a, a cool period uh, with a little bit of rain that allowed us to really be selective about our picking dates and not have this incredible pressure of, of heat and ripening going on. So we could really uh, uh, be very, very uh, particular about picking each of the eight vineyards that we have in the Willamette Valley at exactly the right time. Uh, all of the vineyards are either organically, biodynamically, or live uh, farmed, as has been the case since the beginning. And um, this was a, a relatively large vintage in terms of, of quantities, but not too big. It was, um, it was really had a lot of fantastic characteristics, the 2017 vintage, and provided an enormous amount of variety and, 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 and elements from which to work with when it came to blending the Willamette Valley. Yes, and of course, blending is a, is a new exercise for me because you don't blend it very really naturally. And uh, this, uh, this is an exercise which uh, 
I mean, our aim is to really craft uh, and, and bring the spirit of uh, the Willamette Valley into, uh, into that wine. So we have a diversity, this diversity of vineyards and um, harvest uh, stretches over a good two weeks. So these wines are really, uh, really different and bring a, a specific character. So crafting this, this blend is a fascinating process and something, well, of course, I'm... Uh, not familiar with in, in Burgundy, and it's a great experience to um, it's a great experience to do. And uh, so this was a a, a vintage that um, uh, evolved very uh, gently. Uh, what what happened in the cellar was was a bit the same as during the se the season. Very gently, um, we left it uh, uh, mature in the in the barrels. Um, uh, in uh, with the uh, required amount of time, we bottled relatively late, about uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, 2019. Uh, we have about 30% uh, new oak in that, uh, in, in that wine. Um, so good balance of, uh, of, of new oak, not too much. And this is on fine unfiltered because really I, I, I really uh, believe in, uh, in, in the presentation and the, the, the fact that the wine should be as natural as possible and uh, not manufactured. And uh, uh, since uh, it's uh, bottling, uh, it has evolved very nicely, come together and is really showing very, uh, uh, very pleasantly today.